All right, so uh, next up we have uh, Peter Alt from KTA Taylor. He's going to talk about maintaining modern bridge coding systems. So um, how many people in here are familiar with the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York City? Fair number. So it's a little over two mile long suspension bridge, um, two levels um, connecting Staten Island to, to Brooklyn. Um, and the sort of impetus for this talk came to me when I was doing, so, so they had put a uh, steel orthotropic deck on the upper level, painted the supporting kind of steel, and we were doing kind of a final project walkthrough, myself and the owner, and, um, and we're looking around at the rest of the, the stiffening trusses and some of the steel below the bridge and said, kind of looks bad now, maybe we ought to consider repainting it. Um, about a million square feet of steel, and, and the knee-jerk reaction was to sandblast and paint it. Well, it was a inorganic zinc, or an organic zinc epoxyurethane system that was about 20 years old, had some spots that were in bad shape, a lot of it was in good shape, and, and as we started to go through the design process, um, we started questioning that. And, and so this presentation isn't necessarily about that bridge specifically, but um, I'll go back to that experience because it's illustrative of what I'm trying to, trying to point out. So in, and for, for uh, Tribal Bridge and Tunnel Authority, which is the owner, their maintenance painting program for 25 years was driven by one of two things. Either it had to look pretty because somebody in the public was upset, or we had to get rid of lead paint. They had seven million square feet of steel with lead paint on it that we had inventoried in the mid-90s, and, and for 20 years they were basically focusing on getting that down. Now it's about 5% of that surface area has lead paint remaining on it. Most of that's inside towers and things, places where it may or may not matter. Um, so if you're, think, if, you're, if you're driven by removing lead paint, mitigating that risk anyway, you are sort of, I'm sorry, let me back up a step. So, so there's five kind of maintenance options that you might consider, right? You might do nothing. You might do some spot painting, address some local areas. You might do some zone painting and address sort of bigger areas that are susceptible to corrosion or maybe have aesthetic concerns. You might do some overcoating or encapsulation and you might do um, uh, removal and replacement. If your primarily, primary driver is re dealing with lead-based paint, you're sort of driven to either encapsulate the lead or, or remove and replace it. And as I said, that's kind of what had driven this owner and probably a lot of owners' um, philosophy toward maintenance painting for, for the last 20 or 30, you know, since the early 90s probably. Um, one of the studies that I was, that I was happy to follow my entire career, um, Literally, this work was done the year before I started working in the professional world. Um, it's a, a low-level bridge in New Jersey um, over a marine estuary, 60-something um, spans long. In, in 86, New Jersey DOT was wrestling with what to do to, to manage their old structures, many of which contained lead paint, and many of which were in a coastal environment. And they had 47 different systems for dealing with this, that they tried on a production basis, like a, a real live contractor set up scaffolding and staging and whatever and did the work. They tried everything from hand tool cleaning and overcoating with alkyd paints, which had been done for a long time, up to sandblasting, removing, and, and metallizing um, the structures. And so each span was its basically its own little test panel. Um, when I had started in this industry, we were doing a federal highway research project one of several research projects that were done in that time to figure out how to deal with lead paint. And, and we visited this bridge as part of that project. We actually had some test panels on it. We went back and visited it in 2008 with a, a federal highway used to have a, a, I'm sorry, not 2008, in 1996, I think, federal highway used to have a coatings task force. And I took them all out to see this. And, and then in 2008, uh, Chris Farshan and I went out and looked at it again. At that time, it would have been um, uh, about 20 years old, 22 years old. And, and at, at both of those inspections, I gave everybody a data sheet, and I said, give me a one to 10 rating on every span. And didn't know what I was gonna do with that data when it first started, um, but Chris and I put this, this paper together after we looked at it 20 years. And, and the predominant piece of data for all this stuff was a variation of the ASTM rating for percent area rusted. And, and, and the two reference points I'll, I'll talk about are a four, which is three to 10% rusting of the surface area, which is kind of when you're probably gonna to wanna to think about painting it. 
and a, a seven, which is a few tenths of a percent of rusting, which is when you're going to start to notice that the coating system is breaking down. So, um, and, and the pay, this work was published in JPCL, and it's been presented a few other places. I'm not going to get super into the weeds here, um, but but I do want to explain a little bit about what we had done with that data. So so we tried to break every span and, and call it either a success, a failure, and I don't mean failure in the sense that it was a catastrophic failure, that's the red column, but that yellow failure is like it lasted 20 years, which is, you know, it failed at 20 years, right? Um, and, the, and the red thing is, the red, red category of premature failure is it failed at the eight year, you know, it was time to think about painting it at eight years. So we take these 47 systems, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about this plot. We analyzed it a bunch of different ways, but I think this sets the stage for how the industry reacted to the lead paint problem. And, and so what we did is, with those categories, the bars in each of these columns represent a generic kind of paint. Um, and and, and the, the height of the bar represents the percent of those spans that fall into that category that were either a success, a failure, or a catastrophic failure. The, the blue dot is the 1986 price, inflation adjusted to 2008, right? So the dollars don't really mean anything. Um, but but what you, get, you look at this data, and so, so based on kind of what was going on in the late 80s, um, metallizing was, was pretty much a guaranteed success, right, at three times the cost of all the liquid paint options. Go to the other end of the spectrum, and you have aluminum... You know, there used to be a lot of aluminum mast interest in aluminum mastics as an overcoating. Um, so there were eight systems on the New Jersey Bridge. Um, one was a success, two were fail catastrophic failures, and the other five were kind of in the middle. Um, again, look at the blue dot, that was kind of the cheapest system. So you can see here from this data that there's a cost-risk relationship that we're dealing with here, right? Coating systems don't all fail at 20 years, right? There's a distribution depending on you know, what the, the quality of the system, who knows what other variables. And, and if you look at this data, um, you sort of see why we ended up largely blasting and repainting with zinc epoxyurethane systems. That's the third bar there is the organic zinc pile. Um, and, and you see you get sort of a 70% chance of success with a nominal cost increase, right? Again, based on that time frame. So, and, and inorganic zincs, you know, there's all sorts of challenges with inorganic zincs. In that time frame, we were moving, or there was a lot of interest in the, the um, alkali silicate inorganic zincs, which are water-based. There was a lot of problems with them. You know, a few failures there kind of killed the whole category, um, except for in the shop. So, so it's a good perspective of why we got where we got. And, and the last thing I'll point out is, remember I said these are 1986 numbers. So in the previous presentation, you saw some interest in metallizing. Metallizing costs now are probably a 30% premium. Depends on whether you're in the shop or in the field, right? But, but somewhere in that range, it, the, the three times number doesn't really apply anymore. Um, so that is something else that changed. Um, just real quickly, um, the data looked a couple different ways. Shows, I think this is kind of interesting. Three coats is a lot better than one or two coats. And the cost is kind of the same, right, on average. So, so there's some specific instances where it might be a problem, but um, uh, surface preparation, SP10 is better than SP6, better than hand tool cleaning. You can sort of, again, you can do the math and see the, the cost increase and the, and the risk um, decrease and, and decide whether you want to make that business decision. Um, same thing with the use of a zinc-rich primer. So there's some good data in the literature to explain kind of why the industry moved from, I got this old lead paint you know, lead paint over mill scale, it may or may not be popping off, it, and, and let's just blast it and put zinc epoxy urethane on. So the question is, does that logic still apply to this 20-year-old zinc epoxy urethane structure that's starting to break down? Um, to put it in perspective, it was somewhere between the, the rating of seven and four, right? Um, so time to start thinking about doing something. So we get, again, we go back to the same list of things. Well, I can do nothing and, and so forth. And, and let me walk through those uh, sort of generically, but I'll allude to the Verrazano a few times. So, so do nothing. 
So do nothing sort of implies that you're kind of okay with the way it looks, right? You don't mind, you know, the railroad bridges are classic examples where they don't mind if they look rusty. Um, but there is a consequence to pay sooner or later, right? And, and this is from a, a project we did where the owner had um, a couple of uh, little through truss bridges. They wanted to replace them in a 10 to 20 year time frame. They didn't want to blast and paint them, spend the money for that. So, so they were looking at creative options to, to get through this design phase to the replacement. So one of the things we did is we worked with an engineering firm to collect some, some corrosion loss data. Um, that's the blue curves is the kind of current condition, sort of a distribution of the percent loss that we observed. Um, and, and the red, gray, and yellow curves are, are future states um, with a given loss rate in a given time frame. And, and we could further refine this to either say, okay, here are the elements of that bridge which should be replaced today to make sure you're gonna to get to your objective end state, or project out when you ought to revisit the bridge and look at these elements and see if they're still meeting their criteria, you know, what our inspection interval should be to make sure we replace steel when it's necessary. Um, so that's sort of, you know, something a lot of people don't think about they tend to think about aesthetics when they're thinking about doing nothing, but there is this corrosion piece. And there's actually a lot of, of, of a fair amount of literature, uh, research in the literature that shows that zinc primers actually do inhibit not only corrosion spread this way, which is what a lot of people think about, but also corrosion spread into the thickness um, um, of the, the member. So a second option you might consider is spot painting. So this is a, a different research project that we had done um, just to sort of orient you. Both pictures are the same set of test panels. They were pre-rusted steel, bolted together, rusted some more, cleaned and painted. They sort of represent a, um, um, a splice plate that you might be choosing to do maintenance on. Um, there's four different coating systems for those of you that can can get a sense of the color differences, that's what you're seeing there. And then within each of the coating systems, there's a lot of different surface preps. Um, the rusty stuff in the lower right-hand picture are surface preparations where power tool, all the rust wasn't removed, um, what have you. Um, the not rusty stuff is more complete surface preparations with abrasive blasting, SP power tool cleaning to white metal, um, water jetting or, or wet abrasive blasting, so, so more thorough things where you're removing all the rust. And, and sort of the point I want to make here is, um, so the, 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 the picture on the left um, was exposed on a test fence outside of our facility, you know, central New Jersey, sort of rural environment, you know, you can start to see some breakdown, but it looks pretty good. The one on the right, for four months, we sprayed them with de-icing de salt mixed with water once a week, four months in the winter, right? Not a lot of salt. These aren't getting like salt fog cabinet salt. And you can see the difference. And basically what the salt does is it gets in and makes the rust keep rusting, right? So if you're gonna do spot painting, you need to think about two things. You need to think about how much surface prep you're gonna do and what environment you're in. And so again, bring it back to the Verrazano where they had some connection plates and stuff that were rusting badly. Um, if we were gonna do something and we wanted to get you know, years, not, not year, of, of benefit from it, at least aesthetically and, and from a corrosion standpoint, um, we needed to break out a blast nozzle or something, right? We couldn't, we couldn't just, you know, clean it off to an SP3. Um, because in New York, it's salted, heavily salted. Um, so the next option is zone painting. And this, this is interesting to me. Um, I, I remember, um, when I first started as an engineer doing a, the research project I mentioned on lead paint, um, we had to do a survey of all the states. Back then you did a survey by picking up the phone and talking to somebody or sending out a piece of paper that they send back to you. And as the young guy in the office, I got to make all the phone calls and try and get people to talk to me. And, and one of the topics we had in there was, do you do zone painting? And, and I remember people saying, what is that? Because in the lead paint days, you got the can of paint and you splashed it on everywhere and there wasn't a lot of thought went into it, right? So, so we see a lot more of this now, especially in new designs where we'll put a more durable system on beam ends or whatever and, and maybe less durable elsewhere or we'll coat fascia, um, you know, maybe metalized fascia gets a color coat for aesthetics. Um, and, and one of the things we're also seeing is in maintenance, we'll go out and paint 
beam ends, sometimes the exterior fascia, or in this case, um, the, the bottom flange, right, where you got some salt effects and so forth. The interesting thing about zone painting is when do you do it, right? Do you do it when you got a lot of heavy rusting, when, which circles you back to the picture I showed you a minute ago, or do you do it when you got just that beginning part of breakdown, and you can take advantage of the fact that you don't need to do a lot of surface prep to provide another layer of protection. And, and it's hard for a lot of states to justify painting something that doesn't look bad, right? But that's probably when you get the most bang for your buck because you reduce that surface preparation cost. And this is kind of where the, the Verrazano Bridge was at because it was, like I said, it wasn't super rusty yet. It was just starting to break down and become an aesthetic concern. So again, it drives you to think about why am I removing all this largely good paint, right? Just because that's the way I always did it because I was in a lead paint mindset. So here's Verrazano Narrows Bridge, for those of you that, that have never seen it before. And, and you know, the next, if you remember back to my slide, the next thing on the list is overcoating. So, so we got to the point where you know, we want this thing to look good, so we want to address the corrosion areas and then overcoat the whole thing so we have a nice, clean, aesthetically pleasing appearance for the people that paid $25 to drive across the bridge. Um, People haven't thought too much about what to do there. Um, this particular project, they wanted to integrate a bunch of um, structural work with the project, because they were build, putting a two mile long work platform out, right? You might as well do as much as you can while you're, while you're there. Um, so they, they put the original packages, so client was intrigued by my thinking on this, but still wanted to go blast and repaint and do this structural work. So, so they put the bid package together, project went out to bid, came in way over budget. So then he calls me up and he says, hey, you know that thing we were talking about? Let's figure out how to reduce the scope here. So we talked about a lot of different options. We talked about power tool cleaning, the pluses and minuses of that, like I just described, and zone painting and all this kind of stuff. And ultimately we ended up talking about overcoating options. And, and the question was, how do we overcoat? What's the most effective way to spend our money to do the overcoating? And at that time, um, I was doing some work with the Navy looking at uh, a, a thing that we now call thorough spot and sweep blasting. It's now an SSPC standard. It's something that they've done in, in, in um, the petrochemical industry for a while. Um, it's something that has never really been codified in a standard. Um, but you basically spot blast all the rust off. So, so sorry. You're bringing an abrasive nozzle on site, which has its own cost. When you get there, you're spot blasting all of the rust off. So you're getting rid of that corrosion product that created that problem coming back in the, in the pictures that I had showed you of the test panels. Um, and then you're sweep blasting the rest of the retained paint, and that does two things. First of all, it roughens the surface so you get good adhesion, but second of all, it, I don't really like this, but it's the most descriptive, it proof tests, if you will, the existing paint, and if it's bad, it comes off, right? And, and for anybody that's ever used a blast nozzle, what you notice is when, you, when you're blasting paint off, the first thing that happens is all the loose stuff comes flying off. And it's always way more than you think it would be. And then the hard work starts because you've got to get all the tight stuff off. And, and in, in our study with the Navy, which is tank coating, it's a little bit different thing, it, it was kind of an 80-20 rule where you spent 80% of your time getting all the tightly adherent paint off. And the question was, why? Why are we wasting our time? It's probably fine, leave it there. As it turns out, this owner had done on another bridge, the base of the tower with that same technique as a demonstration project, probably, 2000, probably 2008, because it was about when we did the New, New Jersey DOT report. Um, and so we went out, climbed down the tower and looked at it and it seemed to all be doing well, right? Um, you could see, you know, you get up close to it, you could see where they had gone to white metal because the paint texture was wrong, but, you know, the birds and the fish don't notice. Um, so, so we started to seriously think about that. Um, ultimately, they, um, they, they went with, um, so at that time, so th there's a standard now, SSPC SP18 for this spot and sweep surface prep. At that time, we were still crunching through the process of publishing the standard, but we took about a lot of that language and put it in a special provision, relet talked to some contractors in the area. There were a little, there were some issues we had to work through with them, you know, practical issues. Um, rebid the project, basically got all the steel repair done they want, 
and the whole paint project done for their budget number. I don't recall exactly, but it was something like 20% less than the initial bids. How much of that was contractors sharpening their pencil versus changing the process? You know, we'll never know, but, but it, it, it made a real impact on this particular project. So, <laughs> and, and I'll never forget when, 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 I, when the customer called me up and said, hey, we want to do that spot and sweep thing on this project. I said, a, a, he said, as a test on this project. I said, you want to do a million square foot test? That doesn't, so anyway, um, fast forward to, to uh, COVID. Um, so when COVID, we did the test blast in March of 2020 when nobody was allowed to drive anywhere, which was an interesting story in and of itself. And, and as we kind of got the process refined, um, things started going really good. And the client said to me, hey, you know that thing you did on the, that they did on the bridge in New Jersey? Can we do something similar to that here so I can you know, show management how we made a good decision? I said, it might be a little risky. It might show management we made a bad decision. Sure. So, so we put together a, a project where we looked at basically these surface preparations, um, as well as the issue of whether or not you need zinc primer on all the exposed metal surfaces, um, or epoxy would be sufficient. Um, so you have you know a couple degrees of hand tool or power tool cleaning, and then the the SP18 and SP10 blasting. Um, we did a bunch of test panels. In the interest of time, I'll skip through it. But the the lab testing basically. The problem with doing lab testing on, on something like this is you can't age the panel quick enough to do anything meaningful. There was largely no significant differences um, um, other than where kind of the rust was running out of the crevice. Um, and um, these panels are out at our exposure site and we'll look at them and revisit them in the future. Um, the, the field testing comprised a, a I think this is the intersection between a, um, a deck truss, or no, a floor beam and a stiffening truss, maybe, something like that. It's relatively accessible from the catwalk. That was one of our criteria, so we can go out and inspect it over the years. Um, and, and again, there's, I think there's 12 different uh, combinations of things that we did. Um, these are just some surface preps. The pictures aren't, aren't that great. They're the best, best we got. Um, but, but you can see the different things that we had done. Um, we went out and looked at them last uh, October or something like this. This was seven months of summer exposure. Um, somebody had gone out and looked at them again a, a couple months ago and said that they're largely the same. Um, but the, the SP10 and SP18 look great and the power tool is breaking down at the places that you can't always get the power tool to. Um, one thing to note is the catwalks, like on most bridges, are kind of tucked in, so it's a little more protected from the salts. So I would expect these things to start to differentiate themselves if they're going to maybe three to five years out, right? Um, and hopefully 20 years from now, it will be not me, but somebody else talking about, about these um, test areas. So, so just to kind of sort of wrap up, I, I overriding kind of impact I'm trying to make with this presentation is if you're dealing with something other than lead-based paint and you've been dealing with lead-based paint, your, your maintenance program has been built around that, you ought to be rethinking what you're doing. Um, metallizing, galvanizing maintenance, totally different animal. I've been involved with a few projects where some metallizing is getting old. Um, you know, it's another system that, that we have some bridges out there that are 20, 30 years old and people are starting to think about aesthetics, localized breakdown and what they should do. Different thing. Again, go through the process. Think about all of these alternatives, kind of start from scratch and, and figure out how you're going to take care of that structure. Um, doing nothing obviously has aesthetic and corrosion concerns. Um, spot painting, again, think about the environment and the aesthetic impact. Uh, zone painting, think about it as, as more of a preventative maintenance option, in, in my opinion. Um, that's where it can be beneficial. And then overcoating, again, think about overcoating versus removal and replacement and, and the different service preparation options you might have available. So with that, I don't know if I left any time for questions, but um, here's my email if you have questions that you don't get to today. Well, let's give Peter a round of applause. Thanks so much, Peter. <laughs> The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation.
More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.